my name is Sophia. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a part of a group on campus called Turning Point USA. Turning Point USA is a nonpartisan political organization. We work to promote free markets, limited government, fiscal responsibility. We meet every week on Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. If you want more information on that, please see me after. I'd love to tell you more about it. We also, actually, everyone can move up real quick um, a little bit and then, yeah, that'll be good. Yeah, just move up like a seat to kind of like make it a little closer. Um, if that's possible. Um, but yeah, so we meet every Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. So if that's something that you're interested in joining or checking out, please come talk to me after. I would love to tell you more about it. Uh, in addition to that, we do a lot of uh, speaking events. So tonight is one of them, and John's here, which is awesome, and I'm really excited to get started with that. But we also do conferences as well. So next month, we're going to Florida for a Student Action Summit. That is put on by the National Organization, Turning Point USA, and there's going to be over 5,000 uh, activists there, students. Um, so if you, that's something that you're interested in, come see me after as well. The iPad is on the front table right there. So it's a four-day trip in Florida and they give out travel stipends too so if you're worried about the cost we can worry we can um, oftentimes work something out with that um, I try to encourage a lot of college students and high school students to go uh, it's definitely worth that you get leadership training you get to hear from the best speakers all around the country so if that's something who's speaking uh, Ben Shapiro is going to be there Donald Trump jr. is going to be there Charlie Kirk's going to be there so a lot of people that work with turning point closely are going to be there uh, it's going to be awesome you're not going want to miss it if you want to see the speaker lineup after I will show you that I think there's like 30 plus speakers so you're hearing from a lot of cool people so that is coming up next month and if you're considering it I would probably jump on that sooner rather than later because plane tickets whether you're driving down all the logistics uh, needed uh, needed to work out with that so without further ado please welcome John Thank you, thank you. Thank you for coming out to hear me say things. I appreciate that. Um, thanks to Turning Point USA for inviting me. Thank you to this young man in the heck off commie hat. I believe he was the one that uh, referred the chapter um, to what we do and stuff. So I was asked to talk about free speech. So that's what we're gonna do. And they asked if I think, I believe they asked if I charge a speaking fee and I was like, no. So the title of the speech is the free, free, we know, free, free speech speech for free speech. Very epic. So that's what we're going to be talking about. Um, and I told some of you at the beginning as we were you know, having a little dialogue, a little private dialogue, that I was at Marquette University on Tuesday giving a speech about leftist indoctrination. And it was very epic, of course. Um, and I even had my own protest, which was very exciting. Um, and so I was in the room, and I was talking to some fans, and then one of the YAF kids, which was the group that helped organize the event, they came up to me and they're like, hey, you know, you have protesters out there. And uh, I was like, no way, you know, what are they saying? And he's like, they got a bunch of your old tweets, and they're, they've got them printed out, and they're passing them out to people. So I was like, oh, you know, okay. So so as much as I hate cancel culture, I was kind of excited because I've kind of like always wanted to be canceled or whatever because I thought it'd be fun to just like be confronted with everything I've ever said and just like, yes, and just stand by it. So I was excited for that. And so I, uh, I kind of forgot that the protesters and I are supposed to have this sort of adversarial relationship. And so I walked out and I was like, I was like hey, you guys. And they're just like, oh, hey, what's up? And that made me laugh because I was like, like, what do you mean, what's up? Like, like you know what this is. Um, and so they had actually taken the time to uh, go through my Twitter and comb through it, find my most offensive tweets, and then they brought them to hand out to people to show everyone what kind of character John Doyle really is. And so one of the tweets I had sent out, and this is not for the faint of heart, so women and children may want to cover their ears, I said that uh, the thing about definitions is that they're inherently exclusive. Part of the definition of a woman is her ability to become pregnant, and men are excluded from this because they cannot become pregnant. And to this you might say, well, some women can't get pregnant, so are they not women? No. When women can't become pregnant, it's a result of abnormalities. In other words, some women cannot become pregnant, but no men man can become pregnant. And they actually printed out dozens of copies of this tweet from July 19th at 3.20 p.m., by the way, because they thought that it was so awful that it would surely ruin me. I said that men cannot become pregnant and that only women can become pregnant, uh, and that was just so controversial. And so during the Q&A, one of these protesters came up and they asked me about that particular tweet. They said, oh, you said that men can't get pregnant. Uh, well, what about trans men? And so I replied like, oh, okay. And by the way, most arguments, um, can be settled in like less than 30 seconds if you simply just establish your definitions. And so I replied that, okay, we, we actually like agree that um, trans men can get pregnant. And however, trans men aren't actually men because they're women. So, you know, my point had basically just been reaffirmed. And so um, 
It's just kind of a, a silly argument. It's like, you said that men can't get pregnant? Well, what about women who think they're men? It's like, you mean women? Like, yeah, they can get pregnant. It still, it follows over. Um, and so one of the most effective things uh, that they do to combat, I guess, the right would be asking these types of questions. They're trying to corner you into hesitating to say what you believe. And the, the way to avi um, avoid falling victim to this is just to never hesitate to say what you believe. You have to understand that these types of people perceive you to be their enemy. And just as with any other type of enemy, uh, you just have to look them in the eyes and show absolutely no sign of weakness. Because, you know, if you if you show any sort of hesitation, you start to panic to try and sound nice, maybe even extend an olive branch, they're not going to compromise with you. Uh, all you've done is just submitted to them and you've embarrassed yourself in front of everyone that may have been watching. And so when you compromise your beliefs to avoid conflict, you're not actually compromising, you're just submitting to their will. And so they did this to me while I was outside talking to them. They asked me if I believe that uh, transgenderism is a mental disorder. And keep in mind, they had the screenshots and everything from my videos. So they were very aware of what I was actually about. They weren't actually inquiring as to whether or not I believed that. They were just testing to see if I would say it in public, face to face, um, in front of a few dozen people that had gathered. And so I replied, uh, well, do I believe that gender dysphoria is a mental disorder? Uh, yeah, because it is. It's in the DSM. You know, they've only altered the classification from gender identity disorder to gender dysphoria because of the political backlash from the LGBT activists. And so the point here is that they're asking these questions to get you to cower. Uh, but if you don't, they really don't have anything left to say. They don't want to debate your ideas. They don't want to engage in a dialogue with you. They just want to discredit your ideas. They want to discredit you because if they debate your ideas, they risk losing the debate and being wrong. Whereas if they can just discredit your ideas, then they don't have to worry about whether they're right or whether they're wrong. All they really have to worry about is making sure that people think you're wrong. And the best way to do that is by labeling you a racist, a sexist, a bigot, any of these words which they've effectively stripped of their meaning because of how incessantly they employ them within their rhetoric, or maybe they don't even have to get that far. Maybe they can just imply it by asking you a loaded question that puts you on the spot in front of a lot of people, you know, such as, do you really believe that women shouldn't have a right to choose? Do you really believe that transgenderism is a mental disorder? Do you really believe that we should keep letting kids die so that people can own guns? And conservatives try to be polite. Uh, we like to say, well, I just think, well, it's only my opinion, but it's, well, no, I'm not actually a racist. I swear, it's stuff like that. And the reason we do that is because at the end of the day, we believe in America. We believe in this concept of America. We believe that we're all unified under one flag. And at the end of the day, we can still have the neighbors over for dinner, even though our lawn signs were for opposite candidates. And the problem with that is that the left doesn't believe that. The left fundamentally doesn't believe that at the end of the day, we're all Americans and we love our country and we love our neighbors. The left believes that America, spanning from Donald Trump all the way back to Plymouth Rock is evil. It's an oppressive nation. And so this puts conservatives in a hard place because we want to conserve the social fabric of our country. And so we have a propensity towards avoiding conflict in the name of camaraderie, but the left just doesn't believe that. In the eyes of a leftist, if you're a conservative, it's not just that you disagree on policy. It's not just that you see things different, uh, differently, but you can still share a beer uh, together. And to the modern left, if you're a conservative, you are morally reprehensible. You just have no morality. And this is why so many of us have lost friends or even family members over political differences. And research from the nonpartisan Public Religion Research Institute showed that over a quarter of liberals, 28% of them, had unfriended or blocked one of their friends on social media because of political disagreements. And this was more than three times the number of conservatives that had done the same. And also noteworthy is that only 9% of independents had reported doing so. So clearly, there's something happening on the left that isn't translating to other parts of the political spectrum. And what that is is that um, all of the left's arguments have effectively been reduced to arguments of morality by necessity. Because the leftists in the 20th century actually believed that their ideas were superior in all ways, specifically morally and economically. For example, the original socialists actually believed that socialism would prove to be more economically efficient and lead to greater prosperity than capitalism, um, in addition to it already being a morally superior system because it's supposedly rooted in altruism and selflessness, whereas capitalism is supposedly rooted in greed and selfishness. And so the problem with this was basically that uh, then they tried their ideas and it blew up in their face from Mao to the Hungarian Rebellion in 1956 to against the USSR to the revelations from Khrushchev about the atrocities committed under Stalin in the name of his worldview, to the food shortages. Tens of millions of bodies later, they have virtually no ground to stand on. They have no economic argument. They have no pragmatic argument. So the only argument that they have left is the moral argument. And even that is predicated upon unstable foundations since their ideas have led to the deaths of tens of millions of people in the last century, which isn't exactly moral, but they can bypass that by either claiming, well, that wasn't true socialism, or even that morality is socially constructed and is therefore its relative. So. 
They've spent decades gaining control of the media and education so that they can convince people that these consequences weren't actually consequences of their ideas, but rather consequences of something else. So we don't learn that uh, we don't learn about Joseph Stalin. We instead learn that America is racist and oppressive. We don't learn about Mao Zedong. We instead learn that all markets are evil and they exploit people. And if we do learn about Stalin and Mao, we're taught that they were great revolutionary men who sought to bring change for the oppressed people in society. So even though the moral record is not in their favor either, it doesn't matter because they don't discuss the moral record and they have control of that conversation. All they discuss is the ideas and the ideas sound just as peachy as they did back then. So therefore they believe that they have the moral high ground. And because they believe they have the moral high ground, if you disagree with them, you are immoral. You are less moral than they are. And if you're immoral, why should they want to be friends with you? You wouldn't want to be friends with a thief or with a liar. You wouldn't want to be friends with someone like that. So why should they be friends with you? I mean, you want to secure the southern border. Like, what the hell is wrong with you? And so uh, what we've learned from this is that it's not only the moral argument. It's not only that they only have the moral argument left. It's also that that's the most effective argument that they have. And so the strategists know that that's all that they have. But they also know that people don't like conflict. And that's why it isn't, oh, well, you think that people should have a right to bear arms? It's, oh, you don't care about kids dying. It's not, oh, you think people should be able to keep more of what they earn? It's, oh, you don't care about people that need welfare just to survive? And it's like, I mean, as of March, we had uh, a million more job openings than people looking for jobs. So you could argue that they'd be fine. But the point is, is that while the facts and logic are uh, important, they know that they're not as powerful as emotions. And the left knows this. They know that they can capitalize on the emotions of people to manipulate them into supporting their ideas. And so this is why framing all arguments arguments as moral and shutting down any dissent as racist or something similar is so effective for them. And that being said, these tactics are only effective if you allow them to be effective. When you tell them that you don't believe we should be supporting unrestricted immigration from the third world and they call you a racist, the correct response isn't to start to defend why you're in fact not a racist to discredit your ideas. Um, that's not why they called you a racist. They called you a racist because they wanted to discredit you as a person and therefore your ideas. And then by acknowledging that criticism and then trying to argue why you're not a racist, you're just playing right into their hand because they called you a racist, so they should theoretically have the burden of proof. They'll say that what you said is proof enough. Uh, now you're arguing about whether or not you're actually a racist. And so and at that point, no one's even thinking about immigration anymore. And so the correct response to that isn't to say, no, I'm not a racist. I believe in equality of opportunity. I don't see color. No, the correct response is, frankly, just to end the discussion um, and perhaps tell them to go heck themselves. You know, you don't want to allow them to push you into the defensive position. Don't be compelled to say, well, no, I'm not a racist. I'm actually so not racist. You need to take the offensive. You need to get in their face instead and say, like, you know, are you serious? You don't agree with me? You think that we shouldn't secure the southern border? You're accusing me of racism because we disagree on politics? What's the matter with you? Because because if you allow them to employ these strategies against you that are designed to discredit your ideas, you will ultimately fail. Don't fear being called a racist. Don't fear being called a sexist because they're going to use those slurs against you regardless of what you actually believe because they perceive you to be the enemy and they're trying to silence you because if they don't silence you, you will win. But you can't win if you're afraid to speak your mind and you can't win if you show any sign of weakness uh, when they try to shut you down. And, you know, we don't have freedom of speech so we can lower our heads and paraphrase our ideas so friends and family members on the left don't stop being friends with us. We have freedom of speech so we can say things like, yes, gender dysphoria is a mental disorder. Yes, the Prophet Muhammad was a pedophile. These are all things that would get you arrested in Europe. They don't have freedom of speech in Europe. They don't have freedom of speech in Canada. They have hate speech laws. Well, what's hate speech? Hate speech is defined by those in power. And if those in power decide that certain speech could compromise their ability to maintain power, that will be how hate speech is defined. So fundamentally, it's speech that destabilizes society by putting groups against each other. So perhaps we should criminalize speech against the government, which could also destabilize the society by risking the loss of order. And this is how it starts. It's a slippery slope. So if you want to keep your freedom of speech, uh, you have to act like it. And so free speech doesn't mean anything if you aren't actually using it. But keep in mind that free speech simply means that you have a right to speak your mind. It doesn't necessarily mean that people must be receptive to that. So sure, it shouldn't be like this. We should be able to just get along with each other. But unfortunately, it is like this. So you have to get your war face on because if you're more concerned with getting along with these people than you are with fighting your, for your beliefs, uh, they're going to walk all over you and you're going to lose your country. And I've said this before and people don't really like this, um, but it's really... Is it really such a bad thing for one of your leftist friends to cut you off over a political disagreement? Like, what kind of friend are they really if they would cut you off over something as normal and insignificant as a political disagreement? It, it really isn't a loss. It's more of a gain, actually, because you know when you're being politically outspoken as a conservative, it's actually the greatest method to test which of your friends are really your friends and which of your friends are not really your friends, judging by how they react to that. And there's a great quote from Andrew Breitbart that sums this up very well. He said, quote, walk toward the fire. Don't worry about what they call you. All of those things are said against you because they want to stop you in your tracks. But if you keep going, you're sending a message to people who are rooting for you, who are agreeing with you. The message is that they can do it too. Do you think it's a coincidence 
that the side of the aisle whose ideas have catastrophically failed and caused millions of deaths within the last century, do you think it's a coincidence that their proclivity is shutting down the discussion of ideas? They don't believe in discussion. They have been convinced by their media and by their professors that they are truly moral and just, and therefore to entertain any other ideas would be immoral and a waste of time. Do they have the humility to ask themselves, hey, what if I'm wrong? Of course they don't. Because to totally ensure that you will never face the uncomfortable reality of realizing that your worldview is wrong, you have to avoid engaging in any form of discussion that could threaten it. And not only does that mean they won't engage in discussion with you, it means that you can't engage in discussion with anybody else. Because while they know that they'll never listen to you, they can't be sure that nobody else will listen to you. So they try to shut you down, they try to deplatform you, they tell you, he's a racist, and you wouldn't want to listen to a racist now, would you? Um, they're trying to intimidate you. They're trying to intimidate you from speaking out. Uh, and when they slander you to discredit you, they're also sending a message to anybody that also might agree with you because they're basically saying that if they dare to speak out, they'll receive the same treatment. And you can see how these intimidation tactics manifest in different degrees. For example, Antifa. Antifa showed up uh, to the event on Tuesday. This guy was wearing a mask and brandishing a knife. And so he was promptly removed by the police. And I didn't even know about it until after the event, which was funny because I finished speaking and I was taking a sip of my water and I sort of had this moment of like content reflection I sort of thought, like, you know, I'm really glad that this went well. I'm glad we could all come together and have this discussion. And then an organizer came up. He's like, yo, did you see the cops take out the guy with the knife? And I was like, bruh, <laughs> come on. Um, and even then, we can't be intimidated, and we won't be intimidated. You know, you're going to implicitly make threats against my life to stop me from using my First Amendment right. Like, I, I know you don't like the Constitution, but if you read the subsequent amendment, you might come to realize that that's not going to bear well in your favor. Um, but seriously, Antifa, the anti-fascists, you know, they show up, they're wearing their masks, they're like cowards, they carry weapons, they assault and attempt to murder people simply because of political disagreement. And why do they do that? What is the motivation? Well, it's because, according to them, they are fighting fascism. What are some components of fascism? Well, control of the mass media, large and powerful government, suppression of free speech. Those are just a few. And interestingly enough, these people have been largely promoted by our leftist media. Leftist members of our government uh, have refused to condemn them for their violence. And they also throw bricks at you if you have a Trump hat because free speech, economic deregulation, Donald Trump is actually a fascist. And so is John Doyle. John Doyle, a conservative e-boy who sits behind a desk in front of like literal anti-fascist propaganda and a rifle that has killed actual fascists while advocating for less government, more free speech, and they believe he's a fascist. Therefore, we must silence him. And so this could mean a few different things. One, they have no idea what actual fascism is. Two, they don't actually care what actual fascism is. They're just leftists who are just using this as this sort of false threat of fascism in America to discredit anyone to the right of them. And three, uh, their lives are so meaningless that they have to dress up their little costumes and go role play that they're the next generation of freedom fighters that must liberate the people from the evils of tyranny, which for some reason has manifested uh, with a reality TV show star um, being involved in one branch of government for not more than eight years. And uh, the plot twist is that it's actually like all three of those things. And now since I know for a fact that Antifa is watching me, I would just like to take this opportunity to say that I find all of you pathetic. You're cowards who rely on your numbers to prey on people. And you should stop being mad at capitalism and making it everyone else's fault that you went $200,000 into debt for a shitty humanities degree, frankly. Um, <laughs> and now <laughs> Antifa is, uh, they're just the extreme manifestation of the same principle that the left shares, which is that other opinions aren't to be tolerated. Maybe the average leftist won't hit you over the head with a bike lock, but they'll still try and get you fired. They'll still uh, talk poorly about you behind your back. They'll try to get you deplatformed. They'll do whatever they can to preserve this paper tiger of theirs because the very presence of dissenting thought is enough to threaten it. And so this is why they're not pro-free speech. They don't like free speech. And interestingly enough, they're also not anti-free speech. We hear this a lot from conservatives, a lot of uh, boomer conservatives. Um, it's composed of sort of rhetoric like, you know, uh, the liberals have gone crazy. Uh, and they, they want to completely abolish free speech, stuff like that. And this is sort of true, but I think it's important to focus on what they're actually doing because they're not pro-free speech. Being pro-freedom of speech basically just means that um, you should think that people should be able to express any opinion that they have without censorship or restraint. And so then to be anti-free speech would mean that you want to subject all opinions to censorship or restraint. And this just isn't what the left wants to do. In other words, they're not absolutists. They're subjectivists. You're allowed to say whatever you want so long as it coincides with their worldview. The left wants hate speech laws to protect groups from being targeted with offensive speech. Like, okay, that's an interesting concept. Uh, are they applying that universally? Are they protesting anti-Christian rhetoric? Are they protesting anti-white rhetoric? Are they protesting anti-male rhetoric? No, of course not. Uh, in fact, most of their rhetoric is actually at the expense of those groups. And so they want to charge you with hate speech if you speak poorly about another country, but then they have a heyday indoctrinating the youth into believing that the United States is an evil, racist, exploitative country and the only way to fix it is to completely unearth its founding principles. So because of this they have yet again revealed their hand. 
Because it's not that they're truly against groups being targeted by offensive speech. It's that they're against certain groups being targeted by offensive speech because it coincides with their narrative and their worldview. They're not against free speech. They're effectively just against your speech. And even more interesting to me, um, it's that the breeding ground for this is on our college campuses and our universities, as I'm sure many of you are aware of. And the idea of higher education and critical thinking is that you go and you have virtually every facet of virtually all of your ideas challenged. And ensuring freedom of speech is a prerequisite to that. But now, the greatest threats to free speech are coming from within our colleges and universities. You know, a major goal for most professors is to get tenure, so, which is protecting free speech because then they can say whatever they want without worrying about being fired. But now what we're seeing is that these professors who have worked so hard to achieve this are now actually the people advocating the most strongly against free speech. And they do this out of necessity. You know, let's say that I'm going to play basketball one-on-one -on -one against LeBron James. Now, you can look at me and tell uh, that I'm much different than LeBron James. Um, and that's, of course, because I'm not as tall as LeBron James. So we have to ask ourselves, would that be a fair game? And if not, how would one go about making it a fair game? So one could say that it's not a fair game because he's one of the best basketball players of all time. He can jump higher than me. He can reach farther than I can. So to make the game fair, we would need to find some way to equalize these differences by giving me some sort of advantage. Perhaps I'd start with more points, or LeBron could only use one hand, or something like that. One could also say that it is a fair game. I knew what I was getting into when I challenged him. We both know the rules. We both agree to play by the rules, and there's an impartial referee to ensure that. So if we take the latter opinion, uh, LeBron and I play. He beats me 21-3, to 3, and the only reason I got those three points was because I was like, LeBron, look, endorsements from Communist China. He was like, where? And so then I, I sunk one in. <laughs> Um, I, I had the open shot, but still, if we, if we take the latter option, uh, then we would have to agree that he won the game fair and square. But if instead we're committed to this egalitarian concept of what fairness is, we would have to either take something from LeBron that he earned to help me, or give something to me that I did not earn to help me, or perhaps we could do both. So according to the egalitarian concept of fairness, when there's a discrepancy, to achieve true fairness, you must take something from the more capable and give something to the less capable, or both. And you can see this concept manifest throughout their beliefs, uh, whether it be the redistribution of income or affirmative action programs. But we see it now in the universities as well, because fairness, by their definition, would mean that all voices are heard equally. But some people have more to say than others. Some people can speak more effectively than others. So what we need to do in order to equalize speech is to limit the speech of the stronger parties in order to equalize or give more speech to the weaker parties, or we need to do both. Therefore, we should spend less time covering free markets, uh, free people, independence, personal responsibility, since those ideas have unfairly dominated the discussion. And we need more time covering the evils of America the benefits of redistributing income, why everything is the fault of white men, stuff like that. And so they do this in the first place. The fact that they do it is an acknowledgement of the fact that their ideas are losing. So when it's our ideas against their ideas, their ideas just lose every time. And so the solution is to, to, um, to suppress our ideas and promote their own in the name of equality. It's very pernicious, but it's also very effective. Um, and you can actually see how this bleeds into their entire philosophy. They don't like competition. If you're an intelligent, competent person, you have confidence in your own abilities, uh, you have nothing to fear in competition. But if you're not that good at thinking logically, perhaps you don't do much except drink soy lattes and write free verse poetry. Uh, you, you know, you're going to school for art history. It's like, yeah, I'd probably not be a big fan of a free market in that case either. Was, I don't know. Just soy lattes and art history just couldn't be me. Uh, but ultimately, the competition that is being held with this marketplace of ideas, as is referred, ultimately is a competition that seeks to find truth. And if we can agree that finding truth, finding which ideas are good, which ideas are not good, if we can agree that finding out that will be our best guide towards continued prosperity, then if you're against free speech, you either don't care about truth or you don't care about prosperity, or perhaps even both. Perhaps they're attempting to fulfill the old Marxist prophecy of bringing about revolution by destabilizing the capitalist economy, uh, crushing prosperity, or perhaps they're just entitled narcissists who have to take a Prozac every time someone tells them that they're not completely right about something. You know, like We'll, we'll let the listener uh, decide that one, but this is seriously a messy situation. And because of that, we need to seriously prepare ourselves to fight back against these people. Because we don't have the luxury of previous generations that allowed them to take over Hollywood, academia, the media, uh, the universities. So we need to stop being so afraid of fighting back. And this is not just politics as usual. It makes me cringe. They're calling us racists, sexists, Nazis. I mean, the list goes on. You've all been met with it. And you, you can regard that as either, oh, the left, they're just losing their damn mind. Or you can look that as a sign that they take themselves, but more importantly, the battle for America's soul extremely seriously. And conservatives are hesitant to engage in this because we have principles. You know, it's like we've lost higher education. We've lost education, frankly. We've lost Hollywood. We've lost the media. 
we've lost our own movement, but at least we have our principles. And so then when our transsexual grandchildren are sitting on our laps on the eve of our unconsensual euthanizing, asking about why we haven't mutated our genitals yet, we'll be able to pat ourselves on the back and say, well, I've always kept my principles. And let me be clear, I don't think that we should start employing slanderous pejoratives. I don't think that we should start calling people with whom we disagree Nazis, unless, of course, they actually are Nazis, in which case they likely would have let you know that by now, so it's, it's whatever. But we already have the truth on our side, and so it's time to mobilize it. Uh, with abortion, for example, the country is about 50-50 pro-life, pro-choice, but if you break down the data, what we find is that those who self-identify as pro-life are significantly more likely to say that they hold this position very strongly, whereas those who self-identify as pro-choice are significantly uh, more likely to say that they don't hold the position as strongly. So what this means fundamentally is that propaganda and indoctrination works. However, the force of truth is much stronger. And to wield this force of truth, we need strong people. We need people who are willing to take the heat to speak the truth and inspire others to do the same. It's time to stop rationalizing our own apathy. I don't want to hear another baby boomer tell me, like, well, you know, we've always got the old factory reset, the Second Amendment, so if the libs get too crazy, we can fight them off. It's like, okay, so, you know, I'm, I'm outspoken uh, about my advocacy for the Second Amendment, but the hard pill to swallow is that if you don't have the willpower to actively fight back against leftism in the institutions using your words, you're probably not going to, you know, ever be forming squads and clearing metropolitan D.C. So we, we need courage. And I believe that passion is a prerequisite to courage because courage is basically acknowledging the severity of the risk and then overriding that with the power of your convictions. That's why when I see the promotion of these narratives, it gets me energized. It makes me want to fight. And the left knows this, and they misrepresent it as fighting out of hatred, which it isn't. I don't hate anybody. I don't have the energy for it, frankly. I won't allow it to pollute my consciousness. But it's the fight rather than the flight response to what is clearly a threat to the well-being of our country and for our future and for the future of our children. And if you don't recognize that, you need to snap out of it because we don't have the privilege of being idle. And so... We really need to take the offensive because conservatism, because what we're trying to do is conserve. It's almost inherently on the defensive. Uh, but we don't have to allow that to happen. We don't have to allow them to push us to the margins of society. We can change that by stop you know, allowing them to pretend that we don't exist, stop allowing them to pretend that conservative ideas are atypical. You have to reframe the dialogue from, well, I just think, to you don't think. Do you see the difference? You know, like, uh, they'll ask you, how could, how could you support the Trump administration for building a wall? Don't you see how divisive that is? And you'll want to answer, like, well, I just think it's important. It's like, no, you have to cut that out. You have to take what they're using and use it right back. Like, you don't think we need to build a wall? We have violent criminals pouring over our border every day, killing our mothers and fathers, raping our women. You don't want a wall? What's wrong with you? You want to take away a woman's right to choose? You want to allow the slaughtering of children in the name of choice? Well, you don't think everyone should go to college for free? You want to take money away from parents who didn't have enough money to go to college and then have them pay for some kid's college that isn't even their kid? It's like, you see the difference? It's, it's just a reframing of the way that we're going about answering these questions and engaging in these conversations. Because they'll never stop. So we basically have two options. We can sit back, we can assume that everyone will eventually figure it out, um, and we can hesitantly defend our ideas without making eye contact every Thanksgiving so as to not, God, forbid make our liberal family members upset or we can take the offensive we can stop apologizing for being conservatives we can stop allowing them to normalize the marginalization of conservatives to promote their own worldview because if not we lose the country so now is the time to make your decision now is the time to decide whether or not you want to be active with this because we are generation z we are the zoomer generation and it's up to us because if we don't mobilize future generations won't have the ability to mobilize even if they wanted to because the left will strip that away from them if we fail but you still have your free speech, so you have to use it. And if you want to take the culture back, you have to act like it. Thank you. Nice. Very epic. Uh, so if you guys have any questions, I'm more than happy to take them. Um, if you want to form a line, like in the middle, you could do that. Or if you want to sit, it's up to you, free country. So, yes, sir. Okay, you got two options. Well, you probably won't be happy with it. Okay. Pick one. Wait, 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 wait. Okay. Like, I know that's like... Those are I had to get ready for it. But obviously both have a lot of cons, but might have some pros. Okay. But we have two options. Elizabeth Warren or Hillary Clinton, which would be the best <laughs> outcome for a conservative to, uh, you know... Presence. So I don't, I don't, you know, I can't move to Canada. I, I must pick one. Um, honestly, I, oh, for conservatives in the present, I mean, Elizabeth Warren is basically Hillary Clinton, except younger and slightly less off putting. And I say slightly, like slightly. Um, but for conservatives, 
their, their policies are virtually, I mean, they, they are adopting to the DNC that Bernie Sanders created, basically. Um, and that was the thing, I don't know if you guys saw the video I did about why I don't think Bernie was going to do well this cycle. And it was basically predicated upon the fact that what made Bernie's base energized in 2016 was he had these radical ideas of free college and, you know, that just wasn't what Hillary Clinton was ready to do. And so now they've adopted that. So that's everybody. You know, if any Democrat wins, we're basically getting uh, free health care, free college, stuff like that across the board. So as far as what would be worse for conservatives between Warren and Hillary, I'm inclined to say Warren just because I believe that Hillary Clinton is more power hungry and so she might be willing to you know, do more stuff. But I mean, they're basically the same person. So I, I'd be inclined to say Warren also because that'd be funnier just to see like, because Trump's not going to stop tweeting. So if Warren's in office, you know, you're going to get the daily meme of like Elizabeth Warren in the headdress. And so that would, uh, that would get some dopamine going. I might be able to get through that a little bit better, assuming I can't go to Canada or uh, and take a bath with the toaster or anything like, you know, stuff like that. So, actually, I can't say that anymore because I, I am not depressed. I'm like super happy uh, as people are like, you know, you've been talking a lot about Epstein. You know, you might want to just come out. Yeah, so for the record, totally a joke. Mental health checks out. Totally fine. Okay. Yeah. So why do you think people, a lot of people are trying to ban free speech, especially on college campuses? I know that the president has signed an executive order, especially on that mm -hmm. report. Um, specifically on college campuses because, as I stated, college campuses are supposed to traditionally be the place where these ideas are being discussed and you're supposed to kind of go and have um, these conversations. And so when people are going to college, they don't really, our generation doesn't really recognize it as what it is, which is it's supposed to be an investment in yourself so that you can present this to an employer and say, I know about this thing and this institution uh, will vouch for that. But what's happening now with the college professors who I think they're vindictive and I think they're a bit disappointed with how virtually all of their prophecies about what's going to happen with free markets and liberal countries have failed to manifest. Um, and so I think that they truly believe that it's their moral duty to educate a future generation of like leftist activists. And so it's happening on the college campuses for that reason, because that's where people, so with our generation, we believe that we're going there to be educated. And so it's sort of a situation where like, who would you rather listen to? This guy with a PhD who seems to be credible in his field or like, like a conservative e-boy, for example. It's like I might be able to win in a debate about the, the uh, economic efficiency of capitalism versus socialism, but it's like I don't have that degree next to me. And even though it's an argument from authority with like, oh, he has a degree, therefore he's credible, that's fallacious, but still it's hard for people to sometimes get in that frame of thinking. So I think that it's a strategic move. And um, who was it? Mark Hughes said this in 1974. Um, when the, the rise of postmodernism and the new left was kind of happening because someone asked him, like, do you think there's a future for the left? And he said yes, and it's going to be in academia, in the universities. And so he sort of predicted that, I think. Well, Khrushchev said in the 50s that um, we might have not have won the Cold War, but we will get you through your schools, through your yeah. infrastructure. Yeah, that, I think that's a big mistake. Uh, when the USSR collapsed, we sort of got into this frame of like, oh, it's over, like we finally won. Uh, and such was not the case because, you know, with everything with the Frankfurt School, it's just... It's in academia, and that's why I'm excited to see this sort of mobilization from our generation, because I'm assuming 20 years down the, ro the road we're going to have more right-leaning people in academia, hopefully. So. Yeah, yeah, I, I would like to withdraw all that personally. Yes, sir? John, are you aware of any recent court decisions, uh, aside from the Temple and Berkeley decisions, which are fairly recent, Berkeley, why you just won a case against Berkeley for speech on campus, but are you aware of any other court decisions regarding speech codes or bias panels or bias boards and, and by camp campuses I mean private and public. Are you aware of any new court decisions, recent court decisions? No. Okay. Thank you. No, not that I know of. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. So, um, I, 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 I love you first off. I watch you all time. I love you too. Thank you. That's <laughs> epic. <laughs> but, okay, so my, my question is, okay. When you think about the left today, and you think about how they want to generalize and they want to almost uh, categorize different people, it feels to me that the left has actually kind of pushed us past the golden age of race relations and pushed us into a, a modern Jim Crow, but they use it under the guise of like friendliness or inclusiveness. And they say, well, I'll give you an example. Now, in Seattle and in Chicago, I read a, a story that they've decided now because it's too hard to to train black children to do math, they want to do an ethnic school plan, but they just want to include it. They'll kind of stop it. How do you feel about that? I, I think it's abhorrent. Um, 
what it is uh, when Marxism sort of it used to be a monolithic movement and once they realized that that really wasn't working out for them they actually broke off and kind of splintered into these other movements because they started to lose faith in the power of rationality and of individuals to be rational and so they thought that the best way to get people to mobilize would be to break them off into individual groups and kind of have them rally that way so they believe that we're all uh, competing like whites blacks men women just all that in our little this victimhood hierarchy um, but yeah, I, I think that's just, I mean, in every level, just disgusting. Uh, and the reason they do it is like, for example, uh, I spoke with a gentleman before this who was from Venezuela, and if he identified as a socialist, he would be pushed to the front of the line, like, come tell him how you lived in Venezuela. And it wasn't because socialism that everything went bad, but because he actually is opposed to socialism, you would never have that opportunity. And so they like to use minorities to propagate their own ideas, but the second you disagree with them, it's like, you're no longer useful to us. So that, I think, is actually more racist because they're basically looking at you, like whereas conservatives, we're just like, okay, we only care about what you think. And it's like leftists are like, we care about what you look like so that you can help us propagate what we think. We don't care about what you think. We don't even want you in our math classes. It's like, okay, buddy. So, yes. So I've got one kind of, you know, smart question and then one stupid question. So first one, if you identified with a school of economics, mm -hmm. what would you, you know, identify with? Uh, Oof. I'm inclined to just say like the umbrella term of free market. I'm, and I've said this before and some people kind of, there's a little bell that goes off in their head when I say this, but I'm not religiously pro-capitalism. Um, I listen to a lot of like what Tucker Carlson says about the market and how it's kind of affected uh, the, the family, for example, because why I started doing this, I don't know if you guys saw in a video, but I clarified this recently. I didn't think that anyone really needed to hear my take on, uh, uh, you know, why lower taxes means more economic growth. I really care about family structure, and I noticed that there was sort of a gap in the conservative media, I guess, online. So that's why I started doing it. And so, um, capitalism is a great system; it's the best system that we have. Uh, the problem is when we open up the borders and we allow, for example, for the importation of cheap labor and stuff, that starts to affect the American family. And so, some people might say, "Well, it increases GDP." It's like, yeah, but you know, if, if I can't get married and you know my, my wife can't stay at home and like raise our children, it's like, you want so it's like, yeah, I don't want to outsource the nurturing of my children because the nurturing is going to take place it's just a matter of is it with uh, your your wife or with some some caretaker and also here's another thing you didn't ask about this but you're going to get it uh only 10 percent only 10 percent of child care that we have like the market of child care is actually considered to be by the metric good health or good child care rather and that's the only kind of child care that actually won't stunt your child comparatively to other kids when they go and start being in kindergarten and so they've done studies on this so 90 percent of the child care that we have is actually going to stunt them comparatively speaking so i think that parents should be at home nurturing their kids and you know elizabeth warren she wrote a book on this in 2004. It was called The Two Income Trap, and she basically wrote about how um this idea that both parents have to be working is basically just not true. It's actually, when you look at how much money you're spending on even transportation, work clothes, child care, it actually doesn't make sense economically um, to go and continue working when you have a child and stuff like that. What, but, um, what it actually pointed out was that uh, when you have two sources of income, people start to begin to spend on that, and people begin to rely on two sources of yeah. income. Right. What occurs yeah, right. is when one of them fails because mm -hmm. during economies you have a 10 year you know, mm -hmm. sinusoid, when one of them fails, the family breaks down mm -hmm. because now you're relying on twice as much income. Mm -hmm. Ooh, also, a real quick point on that too about the economy. So, I think that, I think, personally, I love capitalism, I think capitalism is great, but what I have a question about is this, crony capitalism, right? So now we know for a fact. Would you mind if I finish his question, I can get back to you? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess I just call myself generally free market, but again, I'm not, I would like to evaluate things on the individual level, so I'm not ideologically pro-capitalism or anything, but uh, I, I tend to lean that way strongly. So your second question. Uh, yes. So uh, this one's more, okay. So the way back to August, when you took li liberals to shoot guns. Oh no. Two of those people were Boy Scouts. Now I have to ask, were you a Boy Scout? I was a Boy Scout. Uh, I, I didn't become an Eagle Scout. I. I I, I, I regret that now looking back, but um, I had a lot of fun in Boy Scouts. I was a Boy Scout. I actually, I met the one guy, Dan, through Boy Scouts, and then the other guy, Bo, uh, you might remember him, Bo, I hate white people. <laughs> um, I didn't meet him through Boy Scouts, but yeah, Dan's a good guy, Bo's a good guy. He hates me because I'm white, but it's whatever. He hates himself because he's also white, so it's okay. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay, but yeah, so we're going to look at them. So back to the cronyism thing, all I'm saying is now we know for a fact that they've basically been, you know, doing basically QE, but they don't want to call it QE, and they've been doing this overnight repo, they're repurchasing agreements overnight. My thing is, I think capitalism is perfect, except for the fact that we did two things. We repealed Glass-Steagall, 
right? Mm -hmm. And Glass Steagall kind of took out the stock protections, allowing yeah. companies to basically take money and use money to buy back down stocks and artificially inflating the stock market. But also, I think that we need to increase the price of fraud. Like, you know, we just had that thing with Jimmy Diamond. He's basically gotten caught for racketeering. Mm -hmm. What they hit him with, like a $10 million fine? It's literally like 10 cents now. Like, we, we really got to find a way to regulate these, these so that we can have true capitalism again. Mm -hmm. So we can all have a piece of the pie. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I'm, I don't inherently dismiss criticism of capitalism. Um, I've heard, I haven't heard those two uh, specific prescriptions before, but I, I actually enjoy conversations um, more geared towards we should deregulate it in this effect, but we should leave these or perhaps in, rather than just like, let's actually just um, approve the entire thing and then we all have to like wait in line for toilet paper. Like, I'm not a fan of that, but yeah. I was say what we have today is not true capitalism. People don't realize yeah. how involved the government is by supplementing and stipending. Like yeah, I had a, a woman ask me a question. Uh, a and at Marquette, and she was like, uh, you know, capitalism isn't moral. You said it provides for people, but, you know, they're throwing out food. And I'm like, that's not an argument against capitalism. That's an argument against the government subsidizing the agricultural industry. And so just, it's, it's very convenient because, you know, we have capitalism, and then the market has disruptions, and then things go wrong. And they're like, it's capitalism's fault. Let's just have more regulation and more of this. It's just like, it's, uh, it's very rewarding for them. It's very convenient that they can just kind of keep this ball rolling. Yeah. Things they call that usually corporatism, mm -hmm. which what it's what we live in today. Yeah, and also, well, yeah. And then my big question is, how do you think about monopolies? What do I think about monopolies? Yes, like essentially, like. Do you, th do you think monopoly should exist? Or uh, it depends on the industry. Um, for example, a lot of the, the monopolists that we think of, whether it be like Rockefeller, um, if you actually look at the data that his company, Standard Oil, was doing, they were actually producing more efficiently at, like, at a lower cost and everything, which is why they were able to, to uh, expand so much. And so in that regard, I don't think that the government should get involved. And actually, if, also, if you look at who was lobbying to get the government involved, it was all of his competition. Um, so as a general rule, I would say no. But like with big tech, for example, I'm not inherently against that being broken up. I haven't exactly looked into it too deeply, frankly, but me as someone online and I kind of have a beef with Google and Facebook. And so if it's like, hey, we're going to make their life harder. It's like on the surface. Yes. But I don't know. Yeah. No, because the, the thing that I usually use is that I usually are is like, if you want to start a business, let's say on the market of Amazon, mm -hmm. right? Don't get me wrong. I love Amazon. But if I want to start a business like that locally, of like, you know, actually people buying online stuff. Mm -hmm. And the regulations from the government are not gonna help me yeah. to grow and compete with Amazon. Mm -hmm. Even if it takes me a hundred years. Yeah. And that's something that personally me I disagree essentially. The government trying to not let the competition in and have barriers to enter for new businesses to compete. Yeah, and, and Amazon lobbies for that too. And that's the thing, like most of these monopolies and, and market inefficiencies can be explained by regulations that we have. And uh, I mean, these were predictions that were made in the 1940s with like Henry Hazlitt. He was like, this is what's gonna happen if we do this and everything has basically come to fruition. So it just sort of makes you really rise, especially then when we're being taught Keynesian economics in school. Um, I'm the guy in the hat. So um, I know it's a little bit old news, but I don't know if you've talked in your videos about it. Um, IG Pi and the FCC, how do you think uh, freedom of speech should be regulated on the internet? I don't. I mean, you know, certainly we, we should filter out some explicit things, but as far as regulating uh, what, what can and what cannot be said, I certainly don't want a situation like we have in the UK where they arrest 3,000 people every year for making offensive online comments. Um, I mean, I guess I would leave it up to the individual provider. The, well, that's the thing. That's the other thing. And I have to deal with this a lot. They have to seriously classify whether or not they're going to operate as a publisher or as a platform. Because right now, YouTube is operating as um, a, a publisher, but they, um, they advertise themselves to be a platform. And so, like, I just got an email yesterday. Very sad. I'm not going to get my plaque. I'm not going to get my 100,000 plaque. I spent like a year just eating protein cookies in my car so I could, you know, get this far, stuff like that. And it's like, no, we're not going to give you your plaque because, like, your content isn't as good as some guy that's like, yo, I ate 10,000 gummy bears and, like, went viral and got, like, 100,000 subs and stuff like that. So, yeah, I, I really just dislike that. But there are lawsuits going on, like, right now. Um, I think Crowder's doing something. I think PragerU is doing something. So hopefully that gets resolved because I know that they've uh they limit all my videos for monetization i think they also like downvote them in the algorithm too so that's kind of annoying Real quick, but we only have like time for like two more questions two or three more questions because we have to be done at 8 30 but oh okay uh uh 
Oh my, yeah, okay. Um, so how do you feel about the push for women in STEM and higher time investment careers? Oh boy, this, is, uh, this will be fun. Okay, well, so women in STEM, um, and I'm actually coming out with a video. I was supposed to come out with it before Politicon, but uh, things happen. Um, I'm going to go very in depth with the sex difference research pertaining to um, the cognitive functions of men and women. So with women in STEM, for example, they're hired at a two to one ratio over men. Uh, and the idea behind this is that we have to correct past injustice because we weren't putting women in STEM and stuff. But it's like, if you give women total freedom, they don't gravitate towards those fields. They just statistically gravitate towards more human-centered fields, whether that be a, a early education or medicine or something like that. And so we've basically been telling girls that the standard that you should seek to achieve is actually the male standard. You shouldn't embrace your interests. You should actually just be trying to do what the men are doing. And then when they, you know, they can't do it as well just because of our innate biological differences, which you know, the feminists will reject. They think that we're both the same, which is just not true. Um, so as far as women in STEM, I think, well first, I think the myth that women aren't encouraged to be in STEM is, is total BS. I was just in middle school like a decade ago. I, you know, all, it was always, oh, girls are just so good at, and you know, no one was ever, and that's the thing with a lot of these arguments, like it's a societal construct. They're being, uh, they're being told they can't do this. It's like, really? Like you really think some science teacher was like, wow, you got 100% on your test and just, just rips it up. Just like, no, you have to go. And it's just not true. And if it were true, it'd be national news. Um, and as far as women staying home uh, and not pursuing like high time careers, I think that women should be able to do what they want. In my own marriage, I would like to have my wife stay home until the kids are old enough. Um, but when women are, I think 76% is the stat, when women have the choice, if they have children, they would like to stay home with the kids until they're old enough to be independent. And so what we're finding out is actually, you know, there's this oppressive patriarchal narrative, but when women have total freedom, like in the West, they actually tend to gravitate towards more people-centered fields and towards staying home with their kids and stuff like that, which is um, con uh, contrary to the feminist narrative. And so they've been kind of upset about that. So we actually find that when women are more free, they tend to act like more uh, feminine in that regard as far as like what they're pursuing and how that relates to their interests. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, what is your view on religion and religious affiliation and politics? Because I know what I am, I would not personally have my conservative views mm -hmm. not for my Christian background. Yeah, um, I actually, I was raised Catholic. I went through my edgy atheist phase when I was in middle school. And I actually, we all, we, we all go through it, you know. Uh, it's a stepping stone. But I didn't actually come to, to get back into Catholicism until like very recently, like actually after I started the channel. You know, I had the Jesus bobblehead there from the beginning because, you know, Jesus is my guy, obviously. But I really wasn't that invested in it. It didn't really influence my politics that much. Um, but as far as how we're involved in, uh, in Christianity or religion in general and how that leaks into conservatism, what we're conserving in America are fundamentally Christian values. And so a lot of atheists that I've spoken with, they'll acknowledge this and say, you know, I just can't really buy into the whole God thing, but you know, I acknowledge the impact that those values have had on the country, and so I seek to conserve those as well. And so uh, a lot of people, I think, that are raised Christian will kind of have those values, but some people just have them, and then they come to Christianity or something, and uh, yeah, I'll say this, I'll say it. I have, a, I have a tweet saved in my drafts, which is, the final red pill is Jesus Christ, and if you haven't taken that pill yet, or if you don't believe that, then you're just not there yet. And I truly believe that. Um, as someone who was raised Catholic, I'm just kind of like, oh, whatever, you know. Because we all, the, the atheist arguments tend to be sort of uh, sophomoric. We're just like, you really believe that there's a man on the clouds? It's just like Bible, just like BTFO. Like, it's, you know, it's all just... So, I think that... Um, when you read theology, whether it be Chesterton or C.S. Lewis, you really, like, I've never had as many just like, oh, wow, moments as when I, like, read theology. Just everything just comes together and makes sense. And I think it explains a lot of what we're actually seeing, like, you know, not to get to, uh, you know, the left is working for Satan or anything, but it's just interesting when you see them pushing transgenderism on children, uh, which we know is detrimental to long-term mental health and prosperity. Um, it's just, it really makes you think. So I guess that would be my take on that. Uh, I think you had a question. Uh, yeah, what do you think of, for the upcoming election? Uh, do you think Trump will win 2020? Do you think... Uh, yeah, I do. I think he's going to win. I mean, it's basically his election to lose, and I don't think that uh, anything new is going to come out. I mean, they're pushing, you know, they were pushing Russia, and then Russia, you know, blew up. Okay, so now we're pushing Ukraine, and Ukraine's blowing up, and them even pushing Ukraine redirects more attention onto Joe Biden, who's likely going to be the nominee. But I find it hard to believe that there's going to be any major opposition research that is going to surface from pre 
presidential Trump that's going to like really like knock him out. I think that if they had it or if they could have it, they would have had it in 2016. Like I don't think we're going to see another grabber by the pussy tape. I just don't think that's going to happen. I think they would have used it. Um, and even then, with people that support Trump, you sort of have to, you know, when you when you accept the dawn into your heart, there's sort of this, you know, you're not you're not going back. Like you know, he, he does this, you know, his, his morality is questionable, but at the end of the day, the guy is just the biggest middle finger to the Washington establishment. Like, I'm just getting, I'm getting goosebumps right now, just imagining him. Um, and so no one is ever going to really be turned off by some new thing that he did. And so I think that as long as he stays true to his base and stays true to his promises and doesn't allow himself to be influenced by the opposition to him that's working with him in his administration, that he's going to do very well because he has a very high approval rating within Republicans. Um, the only criticism I would have is I don't like his Keep America Great thing because I think there is serious kind of uh, resentment towards him from his base because, you know, things like the wall, things like, just mainly pertaining to immigration, which is what got him elected. Some people are kind of upset about that. And so I don't like Keep America Great because I feel like that's going to tell them, that, oh, we already did everything we need to do, now we just have to keep it like that. And I think that he should have stayed with Make America Great. Again. Like, I understand from an advertising perspective, but I don't know, I feel like the implication might harm him, probably not that much, but I don't know, just kind of a bad taste in my mouth. But I don't work for him, so it's Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, real quick, you know, so you said that about the pitch of the chart. My thing on the impeachment, I, I think this is, is is incredible and hilarious because I love Trump. And what I love about Trump is since day one, he has given us the most incredible reality TV show that you've ever seen. Better than your apprentice. I love it. I love it because it just it shows, you know, uh, he, what's the line? Just, he, uh, he shows the planners like what kind of people they really are, like from the Dark Knight, because like, you know, he'll tweet out some meme and it's like that song, it's like, dun, 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 dun. it's like Trump 2020, 2024, and it just goes all the way, it's like the, the eternal Trump. And then you have to go and watch Don Lemon try his hardest to like really be mad about that. Like, he's making fun of like dictatorships and you know, he's not gonna leave the White House and like any... Yeah, the coffee. Oh, I love that so much. He's just like, who can find out the true meaning? Good luck. It's just stuff like that. Just pure chaos in the White House. I love it. I love it so much. I'm gonna miss it. He's chaotic neutral. He is chaotic neutral. Well, yeah. Is this thing, right, on that whole Ukraine thing. Now we know that Pelosi's son is involved with uh, what's her company? I think it's is Big Blue. Then you got Biden with Prisma. Yeah. And the whole thing's now. I was watching Ukraine one back in 2011 on PBS. They just had this thing where they show all the international news. And I remember Donetsk, and I remember Luhansk, and I remember Kiev. I remember the offensive. I remember when they came and it took Crimea. And the thing about this was, is so many people, just like with the Arab uh, Arab Spring. They, 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 you never see it from the American news. It isn't until now we have the proliferation of actual good content on YouTube. Yeah. You got you know, 1971L, you know, conservative research. You got all these guys who are actually bringing you like real other side of the story. You watch TV all day, and like you said, you got Don Lemon, you got Anderson Cooper, you got all these guys, and all they do is is to spill the same stuff as the late guys. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, and they, that's why, because they know deep down that they're, and that's the thing, I went to, to politics camp when I was uh, 17. I met this guy there, he's a nice guy, uh, and we still kind of stayed in contact a little bit in a group chat. And I took some shot at journalists, I think, back in like January after some Mueller report thing happened, it kind of like blew up in their face, and I was like, these journalists are such a joke, because they were at BuzzFeed. And he's like, no, they're not, they're good people working hard. It's like, they think they're breaking Watergate. Like really, like Donald Trump misspells some word, it's just like, Poof. it's like, it's such a joke. And they know that too, and that's why, because if they were really confident in the work they were doing, they'd be like, what do you mean? This is a great story. But that's why they get so defensive, because he's like, just makes fun of it, and they're like, no, this is a good story, and they get sad about it. That's why it's always this vicious response. So, yeah, I, I have no respect for the field of journalism in the mainstream. I think that there are real journalists out there doing great work, like James O'Keefe, for example, I would say is the greatest journalist that we have in the country. Um, any other questions? Yes. Uh, I don't know if we have enough time. Yeah, but more questions, good. Okay. Totally. Okay. Um, so I'm a stock market guy, uh, like an investing guy. Yeah. I follow pretty actively. And any um, watchers of like large cap technology companies have seen uh, when Congress or Senate brings in CEOs or executives from these big companies and they grill them to get reelected. It's really a show. Yeah. Um, but they talk. They brought up Mark Zuckerberg. Of talk, they were talking about how Facebook in 2016 you know, manipulated the election, yep. or, you know, Russia, you know, all that. Mm -hmm. But basically they presented the idea to him, uh, will they ch fact check political advertisements for fake news or yeah. things like that? Do you think, uh, because this is a free speech thing, uh, do you think that Facebook should fact check political ads to avoid, you know, 
Fake news. Um, I think in theory it sounds nice, but the problem is who decides what's a fact and what's not a fact. Uh, I mean, that's why we have fake news in the first place. I'll tell you from example, because I actually, when I started out, I was running ads on Facebook because I was like, YouTube's never going to pick my stuff up organically, so I paid to run ads. And they do make you go through a bit of a process. I had to independently verify my address and do all sorts of stuff, and it took forever. And then you still have to have like every ad reviewed for, I guess, whether or not it's appropriate or not. Um, but as far as fact checking to find like the integrity of something, I, I'm inclined to say no. Because I think that people should have a responsibility to kind of decide for themselves like what's true and what's not. And on the one hand, that's going to incentivize people to just lie, but it's like they already lie, so I don't know that adding more loopholes and things they have to jump over is going to stop the lying. It's probably just going to make it more effective. So, no, because then on the other hand, it's like, where's the net gain for us? Because it's okay, this has to be fact checked. It's like, oh, by the way, uh, we're using the Washington Post to fact check, and then we just never get any of our news out there. So, yeah, I'm inclined to say no. Uh, I, I, was that the hearing that AOC had her little, uh, her little moment with, with Zuckerberg? Yeah, yeah, that was special. She's I think what Zuckerberg said was they were leaving it to third party sources. Uh, okay. They were staying out of it because what Twitter did was they intervened. Mm -hmm. True free, spe free speech is saying leaving it to the consumer. Mm -hmm. If you don't like what Twitter's doing, you can get rid of your account. Yeah. And as a free market, you can choose which platform you want to yeah. use. Yeah. Ooh, I got one more thing real quick. So, the, just anyone know about the 51% uh, crypto? Basically, Bitcoin. They talk about this thing's called the 51% attack. Long story short, China's been putting a lot of money into crypto. They got a lot of mines. Yeah. What do you think about them if they tried to do basically a big validation where they claimed all the Bitcoin is theirs because they have the majority say in the the bit chain? Well, that would make cameraman Vidan very upset because he has a lot in Bitcoin because uh, he he didn't. <laughs> I, he's going to get mad at me for talking about this. Um, I know absolutely nothing about crypto or Bitcoin, so I can't speak to that. Um, but as far, so the idea is that they would just claim that it's all theirs and like. Right, because basically how the how the, the blockchain works is once a block is verified, if you finish the, the encryption, you can't go back. To go back and double spin, you have to do every other block before. It. Mm -hmm. So ostensibly, if they time it right, they can potentially take everybody's Bitcoin in one sitting and validate it as all their transaction. And you couldn't go back unless you rewrote every other existing transaction before that. Is that, uh, is that, so that's a flaw within the blockchain that they're exploiting to their advantage? If they wanted to. They don't have that. I don't think China's aware of it yet because it's like a new thing that's... You know, but China doesn't. Well, that's I, special. I, I, I follow a lot of crypto. Yeah, yeah. I follow a lot of uh, you know, like financial stuff. So mm -hmm. I just figured I'd ask. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can't speak to crypto. I don't, that is, cryptocurrency, uh, computer programming, and language are three things I won't even touch. I just, I can't, I can't do it. So I couldn't say. But uh, yeah, thank you guys so much for coming. That's pretty epic. Thank you.